today we are going to continue our series, Bad Advice. Bad Advice. If you were here last week, you know that we started giving you some bad advice, and I'm going to give you some more bad advice this week. I was thinking about some of the bad advice I've given over my life, which I have given some bad advice. Um, about a year ago, I was at the store right by my house, and somebody pulled up to me, pulled up as I was like going out to my car, and they just had this really like puzzled look on their face, and they were like, here's where I'm trying to go, here's this place I'm trying to get to, do you know where this is? And as soon as they told me where they were going, I'm like, yes, I know exactly where this is. This is a stranger, but I was like, I know, I can help you, I know exactly where this is. So I told them where to go, I told them where to turn, I told them what street to look for, I told them which direction to turn, I said, if you do all that, you'll get right where you need to go, no problem. They were so relieved, they said, thank you, and they drove away. And about 30 seconds after they left, I realized I sent them to the wrong place. <laughs> that was some bad advice. And... Uh, if you're here today, I'm sorry that I did that to you. That was not a prank. Uh, I don't know what happened. I have four kids. I just lost my mind for a moment, and I'm very sorry. Uh, but so I've given bad advice in my life. You've probably given some bad advice in your life. Today, I'm going to give you bad advice. Now, you might be wondering, why would anyone want bad advice? We don't want bad advice, but if we look at our lives, I bet a lot of us, we live like we're following some bad advice. There's some things that we do, some destructive decisions and behaviors that we have in our lives that look like we're following bad advice. And so we're taking four weeks, this is the second of four weeks, where we're looking at some things that might go on in our lives. Last week we looked at battling bad habits and addictions. Um, we'll look at dealing with a, a discontent and just feeling like you don't have what you want in life. We're going to talk about problems in some of our most uh, intimate relationships in life and where those come from. And today we're going to talk about drifting from God. And, and what we're going to do is give you some bad advice. In fact, today's message is called How to Drift from God. And we're giving you this bad advice not so that you'll go out and follow it, but my prayer is, is I give you some bad advice. It's that God will sort of use that as a spotlight in your heart. And as I sarcastically tell you what you should do if you want to drift from God, my hope is that you'll realize, some of us will realize, you know, I'm, I'm really doing this. I'm really doing this bad advice. I'm really following this in my life right now. And that's what's causing this problem. And so each week we're going to give you some bad advice. We're going to look before that and after that we're going to look at God's word and what God's word says about how we can find real help and healing and transformation. So today we're talking about drifting from God. And, and here's what I want you to think about. Right now, today, as you look back on your life, if you're a Christian and your relationship with God, is there a point in your life where you were more passionate about God? You don't have to raise your hand, but was there a point in your life where you were more passionate about God than you are today? Where you're more excited about going to church? More excited uh, to, to come here and every Sunday you would sing worship songs and your heart was in it? You'd open up the Bible, you'd open up the Word of God, and it was like God was speaking to you. you go to small group, you were so excited to do that. Maybe a time in your life where you just wanted to tell everyone about Jesus, friends, coworkers, family members. You were excited to invite them to Christmas Eve, whatever it was. Times when, if you heard the church needed people in kids' church, you're like, all right, I'm there, I'm si I've signed up, you know, the, ki the church is behind in budget, all right, I'm giving, you know, just you were passionate about God. You were passionate about Him. If you would say that, yeah, you know what, there's some point in my life when I was more passionate about God than I am today, well, that means you've, you've probably drifted from God at some point, or you're drifting from God. The reality is, is that most of us at some point in our lives will drift from God. And my guess is that some of you in this room, if you were really honest with me, you'd say, you know what, I, I, I've been drifting from God. And so today I want to talk about how to drift from God. As I was thinking about this, it it's just such a natural thing for us to experience, to feel like, you know, God used to, God used to be so present in my life, now it feels like God's not there. It feels like God's not really listening to me. It feels like God's not close by. It reminded me of a story of a, a couple. Um, they, when they first started dating and um, when they first got married, uh, the guy, he had a truck. He had an old pickup truck. And the truck had a bench-style seat. And so when uh, he would pick up his sweetheart, they'd drive around, you know, he'd be behind the wheel and she would cuddle up right next to him, right? Like if you, if you, ever, had a, if you ever had a sweetheart and a truck like that, maybe you know that, that feeling, right? And, you, and you had, he had a sweetheart there and she would cuddle up next to him and they'd drive around and they were just so in love and, you know, they got married, years went by, decades went by, and the husband, he still had an old pickup truck. 
And one day they're driving around in that old pickup truck, and he's there behind the wheel, and his wife is on the other side of the truck, you know. She's now in the, the more typical passenger seat, and she's leaning against the door, looking out the window, and she started to think back. She looked at her husband. She started to think back of the past and how they used to cuddle up there and drive around. And she turned to her husband, and she said, Honey, what happened to us? What happened? I, we used to cuddle up. We used to be so close to each other, and now look at us. Look how far apart we are. The husband thought about it a minute, looked at her and said, well, honey, I'm not the one who moved. (laughs) And I thought, that's a pretty good picture because sometimes we're like, God, why'd you move? Where'd you go? And God's not the one who moved. God's not the one who left. God's still right there. He still wants to have a relationship with us. He still wants to be close to us. We're the ones that drift away. We might even push him away. And that's what we want to talk about today. So to do that, um, first, before we get to the bad advice, I want to look with you at Matthew chapter 13. Uh, You can go ahead and open there in your Bibles, or if you're following along in the Alpine Church app, um, you can follow along in this message. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a parable. Now, a parable uh, is a little story that Jesus, Jesus liked to teach in parables. He didn't give lectures, really. He would tell stories from everyday life that had uh, special meaning or special um, a purpose behind them. The, the, we're teaching deeper truths. And so Jesus would tell stories from everyday life, and he grew up in an agrarian society, and so most of his parables are about farm life, including this one. And in Matthew 13, we have what's typically called the parable of the sower or the parable of the farmer who scatters seed. And Jesus tells this parable, and I'll just read it to you. It says that Jesus was, um, he was beside a lake, and a large crowd had gathered around him, so he got into a boat. He sat in the boat, which was the style of teaching, you would sit down, and he taught the people that stood on the shore. And he told them many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Jesus said, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So Jesus tells this parable, and it's about a farmer who scatters seed, but it's not really about that. It's it's supposed to teach deeper truths. What Jesus is really doing here, he's teaching this parable of four types of soil. And his purpose is to say that every one of us, every human heart, is like one of these four types of soil that the farmer scatters seed on. Now, the human heart is the place um, of your deepest beliefs and principles. When the Bible talks about your heart, It's usually not talking about the organ that beats inside of you. It's talking about that place where you have your deepest beliefs, your deepest principles, the the part of you that really makes you you. And Jesus is saying your heart, as it relates to God, can respond in one of four ways. Now, if you didn't pick that up when I read the story, that's okay, because neither did the disciples. They They didn't get that. They didn't understand that's where Jesus was going. And so it's okay that you didn't either, and I probably didn't the first time I heard it. And so Jesus explains this parable so that we really understand his meaning. And what he tells us later on in chapter 13 is he says that the seed that's scattered is the word of God. In other words, every time in our lives when we hear the word of God, whether that's we read it, we hear it read, it's spoken like I'm doing, you hear it sung, it's a conversation with someone, whatever, whenever we hear the word of God, there can be one of four responses. He says in verse 19, this is still Jesus speaking, he's explaining this parable, he says that the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. He says, so sometimes, just like the farmer scattered seed, it fell on the path, you know, if you imagine you spread some seed, it falls on concrete, it's not going to grow. In the same way, Sometimes people hear the Word of God, and before they really even think about it as being true or entertaining it or really listening, is this really God speaking to me, they just sort of, they don't understand it, so they just reject it. 
And the sad reality is, in a room this size, according to Jesus, there will be some people like that here today. Some of you will hear me read from the Bible, you'll hear what I have to say from the Word of God, you'll hear what we sing about, and you'll just kind of be like, whatever. You know, some of you will hear the Word of God and, and you're just like kind of looking at your watch, like, how much longer do I have to be here today? You know, how much football am I missing by being here? Why did my spouse or my mom make me come to church today? That's just the reality. That you, the Word of God comes and it says the evil one snatches away that seed. That Satan doesn't want you to listen to the Word of God and there are some here today that you're just, you're just not going to hear it. Now, Jesus says there's a second type of soil. It's those who's the seed that fell among uh, the shallow, the rocky soil. He says the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. So you hear God's word and you're like, this is what I need. I hear God speaking. God loves me. He's on my side. He's for me. He wants to help me. This is such good news. And you leave church or you leave your small group and you're so excited. You're like, yes, this is what I've been needing. I need God in my life. But, Jesus says, since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Some of you, you might hear God's word today and you might say, I'm so excited. I just, I, I really need to change my life. I really need to start pursuing God. But then Monday happens. <laughs> and Tuesday happens. And, you know, people in your family are like, what, you, you love God now? Like, what is that all about? You're one of those Jesus freaks now? Like, come on, you don't believe that stuff. You're friends at school. Really? You're really a religious person? And people start to make fun of you for believing in God, and you start to think, yeah, maybe, maybe that God stuff's not really for me after all. Jesus says you're like the person in rocky soil. He says that the third soil, the seed that fell among the thorns, represent, represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. Again, these are people who you hear the word of God and you're like, yeah, I need this. I know this is true. I know God's speaking to me. But life gets in the way. You start to worry about all the things that are going on in your life and they crowd out all the room that you have for God. You know, maybe you're a student and you've got student debt and you're like, I got so much student debt. I got to get a second job. I got to get a third job. I don't have time for church. I don't have time for God. <laughs> I got to deal with my problems. Or you're newly married and so you're just trying to figure out marriage, and that's hard, and that's confusing, and you're like, what did I get into? And then you have a kid, <laughs> and you're like, what did I really get into? And then you have, you know, you have another kid, and you're losing your money, and it's going away, and you need to figure out how to make more, and then you have another kid, you buy a minivan, and that's terrible, and like, <laughs> you're like, now I got, how do I pay for that minivan? And then you're buying a bigger house, and all the worries of life, choke it away. You're like, oh, God, yeah, I wish I had time for God, but I don't have time for God. You're the seed that fell among the thorns. And the fourth soil, Jesus says, though, is the seed that fell on good soil. He says it represents those who hear the word of God and understand, those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much has been planted. Jesus says that there's some people who they hear God's word and they know it's God speaking and even though it's hard to listen and even though it's hard to obey and even though they get made fun of and there's worries in life, they keep listening to words, God's word and so God heals their, them and transforms them and changes their lives and it's like a crop that produces 30, 60, 100 fold. You know, if I came to you and I said, hey, I've got a great retirement plan, I will uh, produce, hey, you'll reap a harvest of 30, 60, 100 times what you invest, you know, in no time at all. You might get excited, but you should know it's a Ponzi scheme probably. Like, it's just, it's too good to be true. In Jesus' day, if you're a farmer and you reaped a harvest of eight or ten times what you, what you sowed, you were like a pretty well-off person. So what Jesus is talking about is the kind of growth that can only come to our lives when God is there and he works a miracle in our lives. And I bet we read that. And we're like, yeah, that's exactly what I want Jesus to do in my life. I want him, to, I want him to, to bring that kind of harvest into my life, that sort of transformation, that sort of healing, those fruitful relationships. But remember what we said. We said that there's a good chance that some of us are drifting away from God. And before we can experience that, we have to understand why we're drifting away from God. The book of Hebrews says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth that we have heard. 
or we may drift away from it. We have to listen very carefully to God's word and what it says to us, or we're liable to to drift away, to fall away from it. I grew up in Southern California, and I used to go to the beach all the time in California. All the time as a kid, we'd go to the beach. And whenever we'd go to the beach, before we were allowed to go out into the water, my mom would say, what lifeguard station are we at? And I would say, I don't know, Mom. I have no... And she would say, we're at lifeguard station number eight. Okay. And she'd say, what lifeguard station are we at? And I would say, number eight, Mom. And she would quiz me again. What station? Number eight. Why was she so obsessed that I would know what lifeguard station we were at? It's because in the ocean, when you get in the water, what's going on in the ocean? There's a current, right? And that current drags you and it pulls you, and you don't even realize it's happening. And so every time you go to the beach, we get in the water, and pretty soon we'd be playing, and we'd be getting pulled down the coastline. We had no idea this was happening, right? And you'd look up, and all of a sudden you'd see lifeguard station number 15. (laughs) And you're like, where are my parents? They've left. (laughs) This was the, what a cruel joke. They brought me to the beach to leave. No, it's that they're at number eight. And so we were drifting, but we didn't know it. In the same way, if we don't listen to the word of God, if we don't listen to what Jesus says, we're going to drift away from God. And I fear that's what's going on in some of, the, some of you all here today. And so what I want to do now is I want to give you some bad advice. All right, I want to give you some bad advice. And again, this is the sarcastic part of the sermon. But even though some of you, want to, some of you might want to get closer to God, there might be some of you here today who say, you know what, I don't want that. I don't want to get closer to God. I want less of God in my life. I don't want to hear the Holy Spirit. I don't want to have good relationships with Christians. I wish they'd leave me alone. I never want to hear from God again. I never want Him to do anything in my life. If that is you, then I have a great, I've got great news. I've got five things that you can do that if you do them, you will ensure that you will never hear from God again. You will will drift away from God the rest of your life. All you got to do are these five things, and here's number one neglect your time with God. If you want to be sure that you drift away from God for the rest of your life, neglect your time with God. That means you should not be going to church, okay? So you all have blown it by coming here today, all right? You've blown it (laughs) because you're here at church. And so if you must go to church, if you're forced to go to church, don't listen to anything I have to say. Don't participate. Don't sing in the worship songs. All I want you to do is like look at the lights. I want you to like Think about, like, what I'm wearing and why it's so weird, why I wore this shirt. I mean, anything to get your mind off of God. Do that. Do not follow the advice of David. David says in Psalm 6, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Don't do that, okay? Don't act that way. Don't be so earnest. Don't search after God. Neglect him, push him away, have nothing to do with him. Don't talk to him. Don't go to church. Don't go to a small group. Make sure that God has no room in your life. The second piece of advice, hang around with the wrong people, all right? Hang around with the wrong people. Never hang around with anyone who's a Christian, all right? Don't do it. Make sure that all of your friends, all the people in your life want nothing to do with God and you will find yourself far away from God. That's why 1 Corinthians says, don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. That's right, it does. So hang around bad people, and they will corrupt you, which is great, because then you won't listen to God. Hang around bad people, hang around evil people, and you're not doing that to evangelize them, okay? That's not the plan. You're doing that because it's nice to hang around people who are more rotten than you, because it makes you feel better about yourself right? You're like, I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. I mean, come on. (laughs) Feel better about yourself. Hang around with the wrong crowd. Don't let those Christians into your life who are going to pray for you and all that kind of stuff. Don't do it. Number three, give, and this is a fun one, give into temptation. Give into temptation. It's so easy. Just do it. Sin is fun, right? Sin's fun until it's not, right? (laughs) One pastor, he said that sin is kind of like a sneeze. It feels really good until it comes out, and then there's just snot everywhere, you know? (laughs) So give in to your temptations, right? Do it. James warns you that temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. 
but you'll be fine, I'm sure. Don't worry about it. <laughs> How bad can spiritual death really be? Give in to your sin. Don't listen to the warning of James. Rationalize your sin. Just say, hey, you know, I'm a good person. This is just the one thing I do, or the two things I do, or the four things I do, you know, but that's it. Otherwise, I'm a good person. Or this is just, the, I, I've just, made, this is just who I am. I can't change. Who are you to judge? You know, whatever you need to say. Give in to your desires, and you will make sure that God stays far away from you. The fourth thing to do, love this world more than you love God. Love this world. Love everything that is against God. Now, the New Testament says, do not love this world nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. It says if you want to get close to God, you can't love the world. The world is everything that's set up against God, all the ideas, actions, attitudes against God. So if you love the Father um, most, then you'll be closer to Him. But we don't, if you don't want that, if you don't want God in your life, then just love the world. And here's what that means. Be greedy. Be materialistic. Be obsessed with your image, with your fitness. Follow people on social media who make you feel bad about yourself, right? But try and be like them. That's all you got to do. And you'll love the world. You'll love the things of this earth more than you love God. And number five, if all else fails, just fake it, all right? Just pretend. Just be a pretender. If you got to go to church, go to church and, and raise your hands, but don't mean it, you know? <laughs> you ask God for forgiveness, then go and sin again and again, you know? Just go through all the motions. Be like the people in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, the Lord said, these people say they are mine, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. Be like them, all right? <laughs> Go through the motions of being a Christian, pretend to be a Christian, and if you do these five things, I guarantee you, you will drift away from God for the rest of your life. You will never get your way back to God. Just indulge in your sin, love the world hang around with the wrong people, don't ever have any time for God, and fake it until you make it. You know, just fake it. Fake it. That's all you got to do. All right, so that ends our bad advice portion of the message. I know a couple of people walked in the last five minutes, and they're probably like, is this Scott's last Sunday here at Alpha? I'm like, what is? <laughs> Some of you are like, well, finally, I have something I can put into practice from church. You know, I can really, I can do this. That's not the hope, right? The hope is not that you do this. My prayer is that as we talked about those five things, that it's like a spotlight that goes into your life and you realize, oh man, I really am doing some of this stuff. I, I've drifted from God and here's why. Because I've been doing some of this in my life. It's not hard to do. It's not hard to find yourself in that place. I remember at one point in my life, I was in school full-time. I was working full-time. I was a full-time student, a full-time employee, and I was a part-time Christian. And what I mean by that, I was an active Christian, I would go to church, I was leading a Bible study, but I was just going through the motions. It looked like I was really close to God, but I wasn't. I was drifting pretty far away from God in a lot of ways. I was a full-time employee, full-time student, part-time Christian. I didn't have a lot of room for God in my life, and so I drifted away from Him. I wasn't hearing His word, really. I was just going through the motions. And I think if you're drifting from God, the chances are you're a full-time parent, a full-time employee, full-time employer, full-time student, full-time whatever, but a part-time Christian, meaning God doesn't really have your whole life. That when God's word isn't really what you want to accept, you just reject it and do away with it. And so you've drifted from God. My hope is if you're drifting from God and God has made that clear to you, if the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you in the last 20 minutes, that you would understand this is not where you want to be. You don't want to drift from God. You're sick and tired of being disconnected from Him and you want to return to Him. And Jesus' parable in Matthew 13 gives us insight in how to return to God. We return to God by asking Him to change our hearts and listening intently to His Word. You see, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, He teaches us that we're all one of four soils, and one of the things that means is that in order for us to change, we need to, ask, we need to ask God to come and change us. We need to say, God, you need to come into my life and change my heart because my heart is hardened toward you. You need to say, Holy Spirit, come into my life and change me and soften my heart so that I will listen to you. Another way to think about this is the biblical word repentance. 
We say, God, I'm sick and tired of doing life my way, of living life after my own goals, my own dreams, my own desires. God, I changed my mind and I want to follow you. I want to listen to you. Would you just come into my life? Or if you're already a Christian, you say, God, help me to hear your voice. Holy Spirit, help me to hear what you're trying to tell me. Soften my heart. Make me that good soil. But Jesus says about the good soil, he says that the seed that fell on good soil in verse 23 represents those who truly hear and understand God's word. If you want to get close to God, you have to truly hear and understand God's word. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be a Bible scholar. It doesn't mean you need to know everything about the Bible. You need to understand every passage. Jesus clarifies what he means when he tells this parable in the books of Mark and Luke. He says that those who are part of the good soil are those who hear the word of God and obey it, or hear the word of God and hold fast to it. And so that means that if you want to get closer to God, you need to read God's word. I, I, I'm pretty certain that every single person, any person in this room right now who's drifted from God, or any of us who are, are willing to admit we've drifted from God at some point in our lives, we would say that when we've drifted from God, we have not been in God's word. We've not been hearing God, listening to God day in, day out. And so if you want to get back to God, you have got to listen to his word. You've got to read his word. And if you go to pursuegod.org, our website, we have tons of resources to help you read the Bible. We have Bible reading plans. And that's how you hear God, through his word. But the other thing we need to do is, I, I called it listening intently. Jesus says that it's not enough to just say, oh, I've heard <laughs> what God says, but we have to do it. We have to obey it. We have to follow it. Last night, um, our family, we had, a, we had a little Pursue God conversation with our kids last night on the couch. It was a really good conversation. We did have to tell them to stop talking like 20 times and like, you know, kick the dog off the couch. And all that stuff happened because we're normal people. But, um, and there was some pushing and shoving. But after all that, it was a really good conversation. And the conversation was about, it was a Pursue God video on the word listen in the Old Testament. And uh, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. And what's interesting about the Hebrew language is there's no word for obey in the Hebrew language. So if you were a parent, if you're a Hebrew parent, you could not say, hey kids, obey me. That word doesn't exist. So guess what you would say instead? You would say, children, listen to me. In the Old Testament, to listen to God means that you hear what he says and you then go and follow through and do it. You obey. And so when God tells us to listen to him, when Jesus tells us to listen to his word, what he is saying is, if you really hear God, if you really hear God's word, it's, it's not just Bible knowledge or Bible trivia that fills up your head, but if you really hear from God, then you're going to do what he says. You're going to follow him. You're going to listen. You're not going to be perfect, but you're going to begin to act in a way that honors God and pleases him. And Jesus says, that's the way back to God. By saying, God, come and change me. Come and change my heart. Come and make me new. God, open up your word to me. And then just being willing to say, okay, God, I'm going to listen, which means I'm going to act and obey and put into practice what you say, no matter how tough it is. And here's the really good news. It doesn't matter how far you've drifted from God. It doesn't matter how many times you've drifted from God. God is ready to welcome you back. And if you've never come to God before, I want you to understand that that God stands ready to forgive you, ready to bring you into relationship with him. Because the big message of the Bible is that all of us are messed up people. All of us are sinners. All of us are broken. And the Bible says there's only one way we can find forgiveness and salvation, and it's not by being religious people or moral people or good people or church attenders. That's not the way to heaven. The way to heaven is by trusting in Jesus. By trusting the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God himself, lived this sinless life, died on a cross for our sins, and was raised from the dead so that we could have new life. And if you trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you will be saved. It's possible for you to get back to God. It's possible for you to feel close to God. You have to listen to him. You have to hear his word. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love that is always there to restore and redeem and give mercy. God, I pray for those right now who have been hearing the prompting of your Holy Spirit, those who you have been speaking to for the last 30 minutes, 
who you've been trying to say, you're, you're drifting from me, you've fallen away from me. Those who you've been saying, I'm still here, I'm ready to forgive, ready to restore. I pray that they wouldn't reject that voice, but they would hear that voice, your voice, God, and that they would ad admit it, they would just admit where they're at, and they would come to you for forgiveness and restoration. God, I thank you that you are such a loving father who wants to bring so much healing and hope and transformation into our lives. Would we be sick and tired of a life disconnected from you? And would we experience the life of true joy that you have for us? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.